And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving towards the last session for the day that we have. And this is uh, one of the most interesting sessions that I have been personally waiting for. Uh, now, we're talking about uh, the perils of uh, reporting from a war zone. And uh, it's truly an honor to introduce the panel to you. These are uh, uh, the faces that have given us the news that really and truly matters in the moments that are the most difficult to do so. And uh, with that, I would uh, like to introduce the panel to you. We have uh, Shweta Singh with us, uh, Senior Executive Editor, Special Programming at Aztec. We have Vineet Malhotra, Consulting Editor, NewsX. Mr. Karan Bhatia joining in, Strategic Business Consultant at Exchange for Media. Um, Gaurav C. Savan, Senior Executive Editor, India Today and Aaj Tak. Meghna Sharma, Assistant Executive Editor at NewsX. Uh, Abhijit Ayer Mitra, well-known author and media expert. Uh, it's an honor to have him. And of course, the moderator, the lovely face, uh, synonymous with the Exchange for Media, Mr. Rohail Amin, Senior Editor at Exchange for Media. So that's your panel, and I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce this to you. Uh, Rohail. All yours. Thank you so much. Not so lovely, but thank you so much for these kind words. Well, we have a very interesting topic, which we don't often talk about in media. And we have people here who have covered news, uh, went all the way and seen the real danger, faced the real danger, brought the news to us. So we have with us, uh, you know, I mean, I want to start with you, Gaurav, uh, since you are here. And I will uh, bring in Shweta after that, then Abhijit. Uh, Gaurav, give me a sense of when it comes to reporting uh, a war, uh, uh, Indian uh, channels versus the other global media, where do we stand in this, you know? Uh, because is it just an eyeball game for us still, are we really, or is it something which is, you know, humane, um, more driven by, you know, bringing out the real facts and agony of the people? Uh, thank you very much, Rohit, for having me on this uh, very uh, lovely panel. Uh, for us, it's not about eyeballs. For us, uh, and I can talk about the India Today group and Aaj Tak, uh, because uh, whether it's this uh, conflict in Ukraine or the situation in Ladakh or counter-terror operations uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, for us, it's not about eyeballs. It's telling our country uh, about uh, what's happening on ground and reporting it as uh, factually, as accurately uh, as possible in the fog of war. And that's exactly what uh, Shweta and I have done uh, in Ukraine, in Ladakh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, that's been our effort throughout. And, um, uh, you know, whether I was reporting uh, from Libya or from Egypt or from Lebanon or from Iraq, the effort was always to, to get to the heart of the story, get to the bottom of the story, get your ground realities, get our viewers and get our cameras up close, you know, so uh, our, our camera person's, they would film. We weren't shooting from, uh, if I may, uh, like some other instances uh, with some journalists, uh, uh, you know, from hotel balconies uh, or receptions or lawns. We would get to Kharki. We would get to Mariupol. Uh, you know, we would be in Bucha and Irpin while those bodies were still there, while that shelling was still on to get you that story. And no, nobody thinks of eyeballs at that time. You only want to bring the story to your viewers, Rohil. Shweta, Shweta, your thoughts on this, if you heard my question? So, uh, I would just say that uh, the Indian media was uh, much more bold than all of the international media. Uh, number one, I would say uh, we did not have uh, bulletproof jackets because uh, like Gaurav went there when the war hadn't started. When, we, uh, when I went there, uh, we had to walk on foot. So, uh, I already had a 30 kg load on my back. Uh, walking for four kilometers till I could get a taxi to move around in Ukraine. So um, uh, bulletproof was the last of our priorities. So uh, we were without bulletproof and yet we ventured into areas where there was active firing and shelling. So uh, unlike the international media, which was mostly in Lviv, the area where all the embassies were. were. So I would say that, uh, yes, the Ukraine war was the first time when you saw, uh, I would often joke that it's almost like the Vijay Chalk of uh, for Indian media. Like, all of Indian media is there at Vidyachok and all of Indian media was there in Ukraine. And I think if all of us, um, at least 99.99% of us knew that we were representing our country. And uh, uh, when we were venturing into these areas, uh, India being neutral, our stand as a journalist, if whether we were covering it from Ukraine or we were doing it from Russia was completely neutral. 
and we were the bravest journalists i think all across the world every single indian journalist was the bravest yeah i mean i mean not caring about bulletproof jackets tells the story itself i that have my own choice if i had it we would definitely wear it that was just because we you have to choose what you've got to put your batteries your tapes your cameras and bulletproof can wait we got it later we were issued uh, bulletproof jackets in kiev right before i bring in abhijit but i'll do at the end because i have you know wanted you to sum up you know they, what they say uh, i will have also mr karan batia asking you a couple of questions you my co moderator uh, mega at this point your thoughts of indian journalists covering war internationally uh, how evolved have we become in your view no oh, absolutely i definitely agree with gorov and shweta and while i was covering from the news studios and my reporters were out there uh, covering the entire conflict zone uh, there were a lot of challenges there were a lot of uh, problems that these people had to face i would definitely have to say that we the indian journalists the indian reporters were at the top of our game and 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 like shweta said you know it was a neutral ground on which we were actually covering that entire uh, it continues to go on even now and it has been more than a month Uh, and and then the big question about the conflict that the western media portrays when a ukraine russia conflict happens versus what russia continues to say or the russian allies continue to say so, so it was important for the indian media to put up its stance which was a neutral stance and and that gave us a lot of uh, commendability from international media as well and and i think perhaps the first time around there have been international news channels international media houses that have been looking at indian media and indian journalists who have been getting into the trenches figuring it out on by themselves and giving us neutral coverage of what actually happened it it was a scary situation i had my reporters i had my uh, executive editors who were traveling over there and there was bombing and shelling that would take place behind their back and they would just have to hurry up and you know uh, get into their cars rush and 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 that's a scary situation uh, and like shweta and gaurav said that you, you know you would not have those life jackets uh, to save yourself from the bombings that took place and 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 that's an extremely dangerous situation to be at so so kudos to us kudos to indian media to have evolved to a stage where international media is now looking at us and even gaining some sort of perspective as to how to look and i also i also like feel that we have come of age in terms of not looking at foreign media any longer and you know already raising a bar and saying like this is us this is what we are reporting and 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 as much as you would like to tom tom about uh, you know you being neutral and uh, you being unbiased that's not the situation and and here's what the new world order is and here's what our stance is you know i i saw gorov and uh, shweta go to ukraine and cover this and when i saw them you know that's when i think every journalist realizes that that's what you signed up for you know there could be a situation in your life where you will have to do that unfortunately for me and mega we could not go but i grew up in russia my father was a diplomat so i've been to ukraine i've been to russia i know how cold it can get how how nasty it can get and how difficult the terrain is the language problem all of that you know and the way our journalists were able to handle all of that and not even make break a sweat about it i think that was a very uh, humbling moment for all of us you, you know you can sit in the studios uh and opinionated about a number of things but i think the action is where the war is and this time around what happened in ukraine i think indian media was very intrepid it was very bold i think there were wars in the past as well when we did not go all out we did not in fact consider it too important um so we did not send as many journalists as we would have liked to there were a few channels who did but this time i saw everybody did it and it was not for the trps i think it was basically uh you know to tell the people the truth uh and 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 i think that was a defining moment in in indian media um it it's it's very important to understand that a journalist you know he could be an important person in the studio but when he goes to a war zone uh, he's vulnerable he's volatile uh you know he's reporting facts he could be attacked we have lost a few journalists as well 
in Afghanistan, if you remember, when the Americans were leaving, we did lose a couple of guys who were risking their life. Uh, so I think it lent a lot of perspective to people like me as well. You know, I have reported in the past, but I have never been in a situation where I had to think about my life at the same time, figure out what's going on, you know? Right, right, right. It, it was a very dynamic situation. Uh, right. And, and, and I think it, it, it was like a Rubicon was crossed, uh, right. you know, we covered all it. All right, all right, all right. Abhijit here, you know, I mean, uh, your, your perspective will be different. So as Shweta said, you know, it was like a Vijay Chalk. Yeah, where every news channel was seen. One, Indian news channels, you know, have uh, suddenly found, not suddenly, I mean, or they have become now, you know, they go out, they report, not just in India, beyond that. How do you see this transition? What are your views on it? Is it happening the right way? Uh, your observation on that? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Is this better? Yeah, okay. So see, there's two aspects to this. First is when you actually go report on the ground during a war, it's different when you're posted out there as a correspondent. See, getting posted out there, uh, being there for two, three years at least minimum, uh, uh, would give you a lot of ground context as to what's happening. Uh, whereas when you land up there during the war, it's extremely tactical. You're covering what you're seeing. Now, one of the problems that I realized was when I landed up in Afghanistan, uh, a lot of our trips to interview Taliban and things like that used to get blocked by shelling or fighting or whatever was happening. And the problem there was you'd only see what the Taliban wanted you to see. When you get embedded, like, for example, on this side, Ukraine was very open to having journalists come over and cover everything from their side because... You know, when you cover a death, for example, you don't know who's killed that person. Uh, it could have been either side that killed that person, but then the narrative becomes entirely yours. You frame this in the way you want. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you're covering it, you see that you see only what you're shown effectively. The Russians, on the other hand, did not, uh, you know, allow embedded stuff unless you're uh, 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 RTE or uh, things like that, uh, which became problematic for them. And I think it's very fair to say that they've comprehensively lost the war. But this is where the editor in the actual newsroom comes in. Because remember, reporting on the ground, you get caught up in the tactical. You're not able to see the strategic. Uh, and this is where a great news anchor or a newsroom person compares it, contextualizes the raw reporting in a way that would suit uh, his audience and brings in the balance and the fact-checking and uh, the analysis. Sometimes it's not even fact-checking, it's just analysis, right? So I think that's war reporting in that sense is technically should be the perfect synchronicity of live on the ground up-to-date reporting plus the sort of more academic side of a newsroom, which is calming things down, contextualizing, and putting it in the larger picture. All right. Academic side of the newsroom. Karan, my colleague is here. He has a question. Uh, so, you know, I was following the whole uh, reporting happening out of Ukraine. So as a matter of fact, my wife is Armenian, and I was there when this whole Armenian and Azerbaijan war happened. So I know how, how it feels. So one thing which I always found uh, very, very, uh, you know, challenging was the language problem. Now, most of you were there on the ground and, you know, when you must be relying on some local resource who must be telling you what is really happening, then, then they're at the ground. So how do you, uh, you know, validate and authenticate the information which is coming to you? Because since you are, you know, reaching out to larger audience, so that empathy and right information is the key. So I will start with you, Gaurav, and your view since you were covering Ukraine extensively. So uh, I was there for about two months, a little over two months um, in, and in two phases. So initially when we went, we were lucky we landed in Kiev. That time the war hadn't started. So then we had an Indian translator um, and an Indian driver who could speak Russian. Um, and uh, we, you always have the Google Translator with you to help you. A lot of people also speak English, but you're absolutely right. Your perspective comes from the country that you are in. Uh, but one big thing in this war was 
access to information and access to internet. So you would always have the other side of the story. And you know, when you're a reporter on ground, you cover what you see, um, uh, you know, which, which often generals describe as worm's eye view and not the bird's eye view. Uh, but then that's exactly what you're there. You're reporting tactical stuff while your anchor in the studio is reporting the, the strategic stuff. They have their guests, they have information which is flowing in from multiple quarters, including from, uh, you know, Russia. For example, India Today and Ajtak, we had the privilege of having one of our correspondents, not just in Moscow, but traveling with the Russian army um, in, in Mariupol, uh, all the way up to Zaporizhia, in fact, uh, from the Russian side, across Donbass from the Russian side. So we had both sides of the story. Uh, you know, Shweta and I would be telling uh, our viewers what was happening on the Ukrainian side and Gita Mohan, uh, who's still there, uh, would be telling us what's happening uh, from the Russian side. But Abhijit is absolutely right. We've missed out on that perspective in terms of Russia did not give the kind of access that Ukraine gave and to the number of journalists that Ukraine gave access to. So uh, language was a huge barrier. For example, we were arrested or detained by the Ukrainian army uh, multiple times, uh, you know, detained for several hours and we didn't know why. We had all clearances. They suspected us to be very close to the Russians because uh, my passport has a number of Russian visas. Now, that was a crisis uh, at one point of time. But then when they got to know that we were reporting and they would cross-check everything on internet, they actually permitted us to go to Bucha much ahead of anyone else. So the horrors of Bucha, which is contested by the Russians, uh, India today was able to bring that out because when we went into Bucha, there were bodies that were still lying on the roadside or in malls or outside homes or people who were burying their loved ones behind their houses. So yes, language was a barrier because we didn't even have a translator that day. Our translator abandoned us, refused to go to Bucha because life shells were still lying there. So we still went. We almost drove over an anti-tank mine because I was driving myself. We didn't even have a driver that day. Uh, but uh, you used a Google translator uh, with broken English, broken Russian. Uh, that's, how, that's how you communicated. Uh, uh, if there was internet, you had the Google translator. Whether I saw you were covering, like you called the Vijay Chalk, I even saw the bombing happen during that time. How tough it was for you. I even remember one taxi driver refused to drop you to an next location and you had no choice but to report. I even saw you, Gaurav, when you were being detained live on air. Yeah. So yeah. the biggest challenge, what I, I personally, because I've been there multiple times, you know, when you talk to the local, they have their own say because it's the law of the land. But, you know, being a neutral party when it comes to India, the information, because when you talk to Ukrainian, they have their own perspective. When you talk to Russian, they have their own. So I'm sure it must be very tough for you to bring a neutral stance, especially when it's when there is a war, there are a lot of people dying on street. You know, you have to be more empathetic. So I mean, I, from your view, what was your experience? Especially, I'm sure it must have affected you in some way or the other. But, you know, from a news uh, person's standpoint. See, so when you've got to be neutral on screen to your viewers, but when you are in a particular country, you've got to be on their side. Otherwise, they won't let you move around. So uh, the Ukraine army never allowed them, allowed us to travel with them. Yes, when we would reach their location, they would give a certain amount of access. But it was the civilian areas that were being affected or the military bases which were being bombed that we reached and we were trying to. So there were, there were just two uh, sets of words that I... Um, uh, got by heart and I would uh, say it with all Josh was uh, Slava Ukraini which means victory to Ukraine and Girom Slava, uh, the heroes will win so uh, that's all uh, the Ukrainian that I've learned from Ukraine and I every check post that I was stopped I just said Slava Ukraini and they let you pass and they all, all respect women more than uh, uh, men, uh, Gaurav would vouch for that so it was Gaurav who was detained the only day I was detained was when I was traveling with Gaurav in the same car so um, I have that grudge against him even now. So now what, uh, what uh, see, we, we, we always talk about the beats of reporters. And uh, when, when we see Ukraine now, you see a lot of reporters who have not covered defense and who are covering the war now. I think it's more difficult for them because we've uh, been with armies. We, uh, we, we know the weapons because it's almost the same weapons that the uh, Indians use. So we can differentiate a, a T-72 from a T-90 or a BMP from a tank uh, per se. So uh, that was one advantage that I think uh, got, a, got a slightly more. Um, uh, probably I would rate myself 10% uh, low, lower than Gaurav. But then, I, yes, we definitely knew what was going on, the weapons that were being used, the weapons, the, the anti-aircraft guns, if they're positioned in a particular way, which way should you move? So those were the basic, uh, uh, that was the basic knowledge which helped us in our coverage and also helped us not to go uh, get into the jingoistic uh, 
area, which, uh, which is the biggest danger of uh, defense reporting. And uh, in a conflict situation, you can actually go overboard climbing tanks and stuff. Uh, so you know if a tank has been abandoned, there could be, uh, there could be some explosives which might be actually harmful. So you don't, don't just climb up on a tank and you start doing your piece to camera. So those were the things we stayed away from. Prob probably uh, uh, that's more impressive, but yes. So these were the two words that I kept a little bit of uh, uh, some, some uh, my name helps me a lot because uh, my name is actually a, uh, a Russian Ukrainian name, Svetlana. Yeah, so if I say Sveta, they, they were very happy. Gita, while she was with me in Ukraine, uh, as soon as she would say Gita, they would say, oh, Sita or Gita. So uh, that was the kind of uh, help we could get from the locals who, who uh, of course, uh, considered us part of, uh, uh, what, what would you call, a cultural uh, friendship with Ukraine. So, and similarly in Russia, since you are friends so Gita, when, whenever I speak to her, she says that uh, the Russians are very warm to her. They're very open to her, though, of course, restricted. The military access is always restricted. But that was the personal part. I've, I've, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of uh, Ukrainians, and so is Gaurav. Uh, we have those uh, numbers, some in the military with who we uh, interact with, just to get an update how they are and what's going on. So, Abhijit, I mean, being an expert, I wanted to understand, take your view on this scenario, especially the language problem and the authenticity. Uh, so, you know, what happens is, uh, I, I can give you a personal example in uh, 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 Afghanistan. Uh, you know, they would always understand Hindi, so it was kind of easy, very broken, bad Hindi. But you could speak to a lot, like, so, so for example, the local Taliban commander in Ghor, uh, he, he would just keep singing Hindi songs between every question and then talk to you in Hindi. You could get along speaking Hindi. I think the issue is, uh, and it was certainly the case for me, uh, possibly for Gaurav and Sweta as well. Uh, even if you understand the language, you're not as fluent enough in the language to understand when you're being spun. And I think the biggest filter for in any of these situations is, other than the sheer fear of death, because you never really know when a shell is going to land near you or something, uh, a strike bullet, whatever is this sense of being spun. So for me, uh, to be fair, I've never reported in the kind of extreme stress that Shweta or Gaurav have. I go to do research, not to report. Uh, your senses are always heightened. You're always looking for cues. You're looking for verbal clues and visual clues, the intonation, what's being said to the minders and the people around you and things like that on what to do. Uh, the second thing I found really necessary was to overcome the language barrier is to uh, cross-check everything. When you're told something, you go there and cross-check or you ask two, three other people to triangulate a piece of information for you. And that usually works out. Now, I'm not too sure if that works out in a high stress situation like in say Bucha or Rapin or uh, uh, any of those places, but more or less, Remember, I come from a research angle, so it's kind of, I don't have deadlines to meet on an hourly or minutely basis. But that, I think, usually helps in terms of overcoming these things. Remember, everything's a problem, but there's always a solution to the problem if you have the time for it. If. And that's the big if when you're being shelled. That was very valid, uh, you know, thoughts. Uh, Mega, so, you know, reporting from a newsroom, I'm sure a lot of information is already handy, but if you have, you can send some anecdotes, your experience, especially because authenticity and when you're doing an international reporting, it's very important that, you know, you balance it. No, absolutely. You're uh, right about that. There has to be neutrality. There has to be authenticity. And at the same time, you have to be up to speed in providing your viewers the news, which is accurate, but fast at the very same time. Remember, when it comes to news channels, you're actually tracking your competitors as well and wanting to break the news first. Uh, at the end of the day, we have, like you said, our reporters who are on the ground, our correspondents who are providing us what they're actually seeing, the bombing and shelling. And there is a tendency to be portraying the one side of the story, which is the Ukrainian side at the end of the day. Like Shweta also mentioned, you're actually uh, hoping and praying that you don't end up getting killed over there. Uh, now, 
uh, and and when you are a journalist you are wanting to put across both sides of the story but when you are in a country that is fighting the enemy which is russia russia is the one that is invaded into these places and and these uh, army personnel on the ground are extremely hostile there have been there were several reports we got a lot of students who were especially indian nationals who were stuck over there they were not able to pass from one place to another i think it took them weeks and weeks together just to reach to kiev or just to reach the western part of ukraine and 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 some something similar was also uh, being witnessed by other foreign nationals or, or people who are of color so so it becomes extremely important to be more docile to those who are on the ground those who are under control at that point of time but then the importance and the cruciality of the newsroom begin and the editors begins to appear and i i being uh, at the helm of affairs when it comes to taking editorial lines as well understands it because you have like you like i said there was a there was a mall bombing that took place uh there were several people dead over there the ukrainian side said so said something else the russian side said this is all false information so this obviously this propaganda that is being built by both sides now th th then it becomes for the journalist for the editor to decide what is right what is wrong you are going to use your journalistic senses you are going to get to understand what are these cues what are the people saying what is my reporter saying over there what is exactly happening and then put out a calculated rightful stance on the channel for the public to be made aware and therefore also you i think you find the risk of then uh, perhaps uh, turning a certain tide and 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 the number there are number of media channels media agencies that are also accused of doing that and, and that's why i think it's a sensitive situation that you are at uh, you have to be true to your job you have to be true to yourself you have to be true to your story and then put out what is authentic what is right without being biased towards one country or the other and then you understand how how diplomatic relationships work when when the west continues to pressure india over certain things when it comes to the ukrainian war you have other things that are happening in terms of a lot of these dignitaries and delegations coming into india so so all this in the larger scenario all these things play out you take a look at a 360 degree view uh and then you put in that perspective from ukraine you put in that perspective from russia you put in that perspective from united states of america or poland or or or, or european union and then you build your story that's that's how you do your you know you're doing your 9 pm debate or it's 8 pm debate you it, it's an all encompassing view so we need i mean you been in russia you already mentioned about your experience there yeah uh, especially you know when you been you i'm sure you've been there you would have you know dealt with local people there and you know russian side of the story was not pretty much uh, active owing to different uh, reasons but from the uh, you know playing a neutral role and considering the indian russian relationship as well as the ukraine india relationship any any experience anything you would like to share from the reporting standpoint when i when i mean from the authenticity again coming back to the same thing you know when uh, russia broke up when ussr broke up i was there my dad was posted there and there was a curfew for a week and i remember when the curfew was announced we were in school and by the time when we went to school in the morning everything was fine when we were coming back there was a curfew so instead of buses we could see tanks we could see the uh, militia that's what you call them there uh, you know you could see a lot of army personnel on the road and that's the closest i would ever be uh you know do an active ground military situation something that uh, shweta and gorov are extremely exposed to uh i speak russian fluently so you know when you speak russian you kind of also understand what the basically expect from you over a period of time so i know how russians think uh but what i was talking about and what i was reading about in the western media it was quite opposite of what russia is really like uh you know so it was a, a conflict in my heart and my head also as to what i am assimilating and what i have seen in the past you know there was a fight between that but as an anchor you know you have this tendency you have this disposition to get carried away by a narrative which is popular i think in india we stayed away from that or sometimes anchors also try and extend what the government feels about this you getting me so i think that's also a dangerous path at times which most of our anchors i speak for everyone did not take you know there was a lot of neutrality uh, in what i saw uh, and at the end of the day uh, you know understanding russia and ukraine is not uh, an easy job you know the complexities between these two nations are very very profound 
what we are perhaps looking at uh, right now is the tip of the iceberg. You know, there was no Moscow uh, uh, 200 years ago, but there was a Ukraine, there was a Kiev 900 years ago. A lot of people don't know that. Russians feel that, you know, they own Ukraine. Uh, just because of, uh, you know, the kind of nuclear power that they have. But it's, I think it's the other way around, if you look at it traditionally and culturally, is the Ukrainians who have always had a edge in terms of, you know, the Ruski pride. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's, um, it's very, very difficult to tell who's right and who's wrong. But just the way India is, uh, you know, there's a lot of mudslinging against India in the Western media. There was a lot of unnecessary mudslinging against Russia also in the media. Um, and I think we at NewsX and, you know, all my uh, uh, honorable panelists here as well, they stayed away from, you know, going uh, political. We were all apolitical. We were just trying to show things and talk about things uh, on the ground. I have friends in Russia who are Russians. I have Indian friends in Russia who are married to Ukrainians. You know, I have Ukrainian friends who are married to Indians. Uh, so what they feel and what they say is absolutely in contrast to what we have been saying and talking about, you know, the Russians don't care about this war. They didn't want it, basically. When I say they don't care about it, it, you know, it was a decision by an autocrat and they are just paying the price for it now. So the Russians did not want it. Uh, I think it, it's Putin's ego, which is at war. And a lot of people are just, uh, you know, paying the price for it. And, and I think these are my two cents on that. So, Rohel, I mean, over to you. I think we lost Rohel. I think he's not there. So, uh, I think we lost him. So, I'll quickly move on to my second question, then I'll ask Rohel. Uh, Rohel, are you here? Okay. So, I'll ask you, got a, you know, uh, considering in the la last two years, there was a huge issue, uh, two very, uh, you know, important uh, discussion happened on the global diaspora. Uh, Royal, you would like to take it or should I move on? Okay. okay. You take it, uh, please. Hmm. Okay, okay, perfect. One second, sorry. All right, so Gaurav, to you, my question, you know, uh, there's also people are, you know, they were on social media, especially critics, they said they were worried uh, the way uh, we we portrayed the war, you know, uh, there were dramatic headlines. We got overboard. Uh, Mahayudh, you know, we use a lot of such words. Uh, how do you respond to them? So Mahayudh, it is. It's a huge war. It's it 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 is a big war, and it is escalating. And God forbid, it may escalate further. Uh, will it become the third world war? Well, economically, if you look at some of the parameters of what is a world war, uh, the beginnings are already there in terms of divisions in camps, economic sanctions being imposed. So uh, some of those steps are being taken. In case Sweden and Finland do join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, then you will see an escalation. Uh, and it's, it wasn't Mahayudh happening, but was it, it was Mahayudh ki ahat is what most people uh, you know seem to indicate that are we heading towards a world war the western media also said that but as shweta said uh, unlike a lot in the uh, un unlike many in the western media the indian media wasn't safely in lviv the indian media was in the heart of action um, and traveling uh, not to say that the westerners weren't because look at the fatalities unfortunately that have happened uh, they happened in irpin and bucha and kiev and, and and the western media that was reporting right in the heart of the story so um, uh, you know one yes there is escalation was there exaggeration well that's an editorial stance that that happened in delhi but uh, were there killings Look at what was happening at Irpin. Look at what was happening in Bucha. Uh, look at the way people were massacred. And they were, um, you know, so we wouldn't know uh, until an international investigation revealed. And that is where I said the Indian media was very neutral. While President Zelensky did say that people were caught and killed and they put out some pictures, Indian media kept saying uh, that let there be an international investigation uh, for facts to come out. The bodies that I saw, and I did see a large number of bodies in Bucha, uh, but a number of them appeared to be shrapnel injuries, people traveling in cars, their cars shattered, uh, and, and then bodies killed. Did I see very close bullet injuries? 
in some instances we did see bullet injuries but uh, not the kind that the government had described torture chambers uh, all of that uh, perhaps the ukrainian media had better access than we uh, again in ukraine and this was something information flow through the government in ukraine was restricted to those who actually echoed their line to a very large extent uh, uh, they were taken on tours we were on our own we were flying solo um, you know driving from one city to the other not under any government escort uh, though we did make a lot of personal friends who came uh, who were very very helpful uh, in difficult situations that took us to the front lines with them uh, for example in mariupol uh, we were taken right to the front line from where we could see the russians across uh, and this was just before the conflict had actually broken out in the uh, in the real uh, sense of the Conflict. Artillery duels had started. Rockets and missiles were being fi fired, but tanks. The armor movement hadn't taken place till then. Uh, but uh, for for the Western media, they had access to government guiding them. For the Indian media, we were doing a lot of our work on our own through contacts and not traditionally through government appointed fixers. All right, right, Shweta. Uh, also, you know, one is this: uh, uh, did, did we get carried away? at times you know uh, when we look inside also it's a new phenomenon you know from looking from within and now outside but again our reports you know carry a lot of the habits that we have reporting in inside internal facts do you think that is true uh, so uh, I would just like to make a comment first because, uh, you know, when you're working for television, you rarely have time for yourself, uh, leave alone, uh, get to know people from other channels. So I would like to say that Abhijit, sir, of course, I uh, keep uh, reading his views on social media. So I'm uh, fairly acquainted with him. But Megha, I would like to compliment that she's very matured. And Vineet, I wish I had spoken to you before I went to Ukraine. You've got such a, such a good experience of having lived in Russia. So it would have added to my perspective. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a great great forum right now. Uh, yes, we do go overboard. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, like to sound uh, apologetic also for that because um, media in India is completely different from the rest of the world. And by the way, I have uh, two three videos which I showed I shared with Gaurav of uh, international media uh, doing walkthroughs and piece to cameras in a way which often Indian media is uh, blamed for. Uh, Gaurav, remember that. Uh, that, that lady from uh, Greece who was uh, uh, who actually out shouted the Indian journalist when doing her. Oh God, that's a world <laughs> record. Huh? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. The, uh, the the worst of the Indian media. She was worse than that. I, I can show it to you later. <laughs> I still have it on my mobile. So yes, we went overboard at times when um, you know there was there was information coming in from so many sources. Britons uh, 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 leaking some reports from Russia and saying that there is there is going to be a nuclear war and uh, uh, people, um, uh, I mean, you you tend to get eyeballs when you talk of the worst. So yes, uh, uh, we have been, we can be blamed for going overboard at times. Um, uh, perhaps this was the first war that was being covered at such a level. Um, uh, I mean, uh, there have been many conflicts over the, over the years, but nobody, none of the wars have been uh, uh, touted to be the next step for a, a world war three so this time it was completely different and i think uh, we will mature as we move on there, there were a lot of times when i used to uh, fight off uh, discussions when should we should we be talking about a nuclear war or not but yes if there are reports of some countries and if you, if you attribute it to that particular report then you can say that but uh, we'll definitely take a few lessons from this coverage Thanks, uh, Shweta. I mean, you've been very uh, frank about it and uh, candid about it. Abhijit, uh, uh, what does uh, you know it tell you about uh, the way Indian media is now, you know, covering uh, international issues? Do they have this hangover of uh, the way they report international, you know, internationally? Do you see a lot of hangover of what they do? within the country and what is the next stage you see for the Indian media as far as international reportage is concerned do you think they will continue to get uh, uh, sensation uh, more over dramatized you know do you think that is uh, gonna stay or is gonna boil down to more nuanced uh, coverage of the war look the thing is uh, for me reportage is a very culturally relativistic thing you know uh, each reporter, reports the way a certain country expects them to report. 
Uh, you know, so for example, in Japan, you're going to have extremely sweet, polite reporting. In America, you might not have very animated uh, reporters on the ground, but the context and analysis uh, of the editorial desk uh, would be far worse than some absolute uh, uh, minuscule regional channel with screeching uh, 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 anchors, uh, 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 essentially screeching like banshees. I mean, honestly, CNN is unwatchable. I'd any day prefer watching an Indian channel's coverage of uh, 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 what's happening in Ukraine to what CNN uh, is doing. And I didn't realize this till Gaurav and Shweta just said so. Uh, I didn't realize that they were being, those guys were being given the VIP tour and these guys were being uh, uh, left out on their own. And this is probably why I will any day trust Gaurav and Shweta uh, over what I see on CNN. Right. So th these things are extremely contextual. It's fine for them to make fun of us saying, oh, my God, look at the CGI's in this room. It's oh, uh, it's bizarre. It's crazy. It's uh, uh, this is a news. But honestly, you tell me what part of CNN reportage is news by Indian standards, the kind of conspiracy theories that are floated out there. No Indian channel, even the worst regarded Indian channel, would have that on a meantime news program. Right. So uh, these and, and when it comes to that, I don't think animated reporting or screechy reporting is a crime. Uh, you know, uh, it's fun to watch sometimes. It's entertaining. Uh, I would much rather have entertainment over outright misinformation. Wonderful. Uh, Karan, uh, to you. Over to you, yeah. We have another uh, 15 minutes left. Yeah. So one thing what I've noticed in terms of that, like setting the context to the discussion, like uh, when the Armenia-Azerbaijan war was there for about 15, 20 days, there was very limited coverage which was coming out to the media. Now, especially Ukraine and Russia have become the main pivot and, you know, international Galore and the reportage was different. So when you compare vis -vis the Indian reporting versus the international one, what are your views on it? Uh, I'll start with you, Gaurav. So Azerbaijan, Armenia, for me, uh, it was a big story and it was one of the biggest stories on India first because uh, of the context of the nature of warfare, for example. Um, uh, you know, the fact that you had the, the, the TV2s, the Bayraktars uh, doing what they were to the tanks and uh, the game changer role that they played uh, in, in this battle. More than the context of the battle that was taking place, it was the weaponry in this battle, which was huge uh, in, in, in terms of the way we were looking at Azerbaijan and Armenia. When it came to Ukraine, it was very different because you had about 22,000 Indians studying there. There was panic in their families. Um, um, and, and you know, especially uh, south of India's, uh, a lot of our viewers south of India's kept asking us, "What are you doing about this? Why aren't you reporting from ground zero? And that's where I was packed off. Uh, you know, around the fifteenth of February, uh, we took a decision, and seventeenth, I was already. Um, in, in Kiev. And at that point of time, when we travel to a lot of these universities, including the Shevchenko University uh, or the medical university in, in uh, Kiev, children didn't want to come back. I've, I've got umpteen number of interviews and children said they didn't want to come back because they thought there wouldn't be a war. Their professors didn't want the children to go back because they said there will be something, but it will not be the way we are seeing it today. But the American media was saying something completely different. So somewhere down the line, nobody thought this war would escalate to what it has escalated to now or the apprehension that it may escalate to God forbid, the Third World War um, in, in the months ahead uh, with, with Sweden and Finland now being uh, in the line of Russian fire should they join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So uh, we were reporting it day on day, uh, yet going back to the context, uh, you know, uh, we've had a lot of very good guests on our show from Ukraine, from Russia, from America, from England, getting multiple perspectives so that our viewers uh, you know, and most Indian channels did that so that the viewers would have a 360 degree perspective um, and perhaps, uh, you know, not Azerbaijan, Armenia as much because of Indians present both in Russia and Russia being India's close strategic partner with this special strategic relationship between the two countries. There was so much more interest in uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia conflict. Again, going ahead with, with in the in the months ahead, this this interest will only increase. So Shweta, uh, you know, one thing, you know, when I saw this 24 hours covering, uh, you know, reporting there, 
and i was also watching uh, rt i was didn't i didn't have access owing to multiple reasons but be it bbc or cnn on the international channel there was just a one or two hour you know discussion where there were panelists and they were showing videos little discussion happened but when it comes to india this time we played a center stage when we bringing out the real information and you know 24 hours 7 you know you had your people on ground there was one reporter also of ashtak who was stationed there in ukraine then you have somebody in russia so must be very challenging but in your experience looking at i mean uh, this war and the way it has escalated into and the way international media has projected and the way indian media brought a neutral stance to it what is your view how indian media is you know uh, scoring and how we have changed over the years when we compare ourselves with the international media in terms of the war zone reporting see the media has the same strength as the society it, uh, it is representing and it is reflecting so uh, uh, with india comes a lot of emotions as well we can't do dispassionate reporting uh, i'm not uh, talking uh, biased but uh, emotions in the sense that even if you are uh, uh, talking about a country which you are not on very good terms with if that country uh, um, uh, sees an earthquake we still empathize we we might have uh, fought wars with pakistan but uh, when the when the attack on the children happened everybody in india uh, condemned it every single uh, uh, person in india felt that it was not correct it was not right it should not have happened and i'm not talking about the level of the government but i'm talking about the people so we we do not uh, dissociate our passions from uh, anything that we cover so um, uh, about neutrality i'll just tell you, i would just like to um, uh, share an experience uh, while covering in ukraine because uh, see we, we were not embedded we were not uh, given that access that uh, other western media had with ukraine but um, we were in lviv that day and about two days back got a, uh, there was a missile strike on uh, in lviv which the russians claimed was a military base and the ukrainians claimed was a civilian area and that they had lost 35 civilians so i was around looking for a sim card uh, and uh, for my live unit and we were trying to find a shop when we when i suddenly heard a uh, sermon going on so i walked in that direction and i think gorov had uh, walked in another direction that day and i was walking towards uh, another side because both of us wanted to look for a sim card so either of us had to get in touch once we found the sim card so what i found in kelt was a was a was a ceremony uh, for the departed souls and the departed souls happened happened to be the soldiers so uh, what russia had said was correct in the sense that it had struck a military base they had lost soldiers and i was in the cremation of the soldiers because i happened to walk into it and not i, I was not led by uh, some uh, ukrainian army into an area where uh, they could show some civilian destruction so that is how we uh, since uh, we were uh, four teams in ukraine at that time and uh, we were all covering different aspects so this just added to the spontaneity of our reports and the neutrality of the reports as well and uh, we never shied from uh, from saying that they were they were very limited civilian casualties at that time rajesh pawar who was uh, ex army he he's still there in kiev and uh, when he reports he was not scared that the ukrainian authorities might perhaps pick him up for uh, actually giving out the truth if if if, in, if a residential complex has been bombed and uh, there is no casualty he says i don't see a single ambulance here and i don't see any uh, uh, casualty evacuation in front of my eyes while the ukrainian government might be saying that okay there are uh, uh, 50 people who have died and similarly when geeta is reporting from russia she she does not show their line she's uh, she's uh, just giving out what she's seen in front of herself right so abhijit uh, um, Ab- yeah abhijit so abhijit uh, you know you been had experience in afghanistan and the from the international stand, you know story and reporting standpoint what are your views when we talk about the comparison so this is why i said i think if you look at what gorav and shweta said uh you know that being an indian having that kind of neutrality key, you know this is not our fight uh nobody was getting emotional about it in india this was as esoteric to us as uh you know uh pakistan attacking india would be to them uh so you know it was uh, it, it's much more neutral it's much more balanced uh and let me show you what happened let me tell you what happened 
uh, with me because what I depend upon is every time I hear a news story coming out, I try to get it verified through satellite imagery. So we uh, uh, buy a lot of satellite imagery, usually 30 centimeter, which you know you can almost tell the ranks on the uh, uh, labels of uh, officers and things like that. Uh, what they did was, uh, first of all, the Ukrainians criminalized any photography on the ground unless it was approved and authorized, etc. So any mobile phone photography and things like that by ordinary people of any kind of damage or military installations is now punishable, uh, which kind of very severely restricted what open source analysis we could do. And the second issue was uh, within almost about seven, eight days into the war, uh, they started blurring the images. They said that our subscription would no longer give us full images of Ukraine and everything about Ukraine started getting blurred. Except, so when Bucha happened, we wanted to go in and check the time series images out there. Even the blurring wasn't available to us. Okay, it was almost completely blanked out. We were not allowed to see the time series. Uh, the New York Times puts out this thing. First, the New York Times seems to get a story quite wrong. Uh, then they put out a time series which we think is concocted because nobody else is given access to that time series to see when those people were killed because the ambient temperature in Bucha was around seven degrees at that time, if you extrapolate it over uh, the two weeks, uh, at, by which time the rot of the bodies and things should have set in. Uh, the other thing was the way, and Gaurav and uh, Shweta would be able to tell you this because they were there, the way the bodies had fallen down, it didn't look like a shooting, it looked like a shelling. And for this, you know, you need to have a... Uh, 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 forensics done as to which side the shedding was coming from. We couldn't even see where the shrapnel wounds on those bodies uh, and things were like, even on the video coverage that we were seeing from the ground. So this, again, was very, very problematic where news was being controlled very, very carefully to forward a certain narrative, and it was impossible. You could not buy images from Bucha in a time series, even if you offered to pay extra to these four satellite companies. So there's only four that provide you with imagery, the Korean Airbus, uh, Planet Labs, and uh, uh, I forget the last one's name, uh, uh, Maxar, Maxar, correct, thank you. Uh, uh, you couldn't get it. Uh, then, you know, there's also the fact, and, and this is a good thing because the Indian press will never be used to sort of spin a story. Uh, you know they're relatively immune from being spun in that sense. Because if you remember, uh, I don't know how old everybody on this panel are. I'm quite old. Uh, I'm middle-aged now. So if you go back to Srebrenica, uh, not Srebrenica, sorry, Sarajevo, and what started the NATO intervention in that war out there, it was three specific mortar shells that landed in Sarajevo market that killed about 75 people that brought on the NATO intervention. The NATO classified report on that shows you that at least two shells came from the side of the Muslim uh, uh, Bosniak uh, positions uh, in the hills above Sarajevo. The third one was indeterminate. And the reason it was done was, guess who was in town at that time? Christian Aman. She was there for three days. Uh, there was absolutely no story. She was getting ready to pack up and go. And voila, she gets a story just in the nick of time, which makes uh, this thing. I am so glad that our press are not conspirators to and accomplices in that kind of mass murder that the Western press very frequently is. They know it. It's uh, sometimes very clearly done with NATO because NATO incentivizes people to commit atrocities where the lines can be blurred and then justify a humanitarian intervention. I'm so glad we don't fall for that kind of rubbish. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. If you remember NDTV, they caught a picture, I think it was Srinivas and Jain who caught the picture of Hezbollah firing, uh, sorry, Hamas firing rockets uh, from a hotel in which international yeah. journalists were being housed. Right, now, had we been in the Hamas camp, like Shweta was able to go and verify that these bodies were actually military bodies. Mind you, even now, CNN and all the Western press will say, oh, it wasn't really military. We have no proof of that and things like that. Except we have an eyewitness right here who will admit it was. Okay, who can show you it was. So the Indian press is very frequently able to get the other side of the story. They have to be careful, but this is why I'm telling you, the Indian press is right up there with the rest of the world. 
they will use all these tactics to bring it down because ultimately it's a, a preservation of your territory. You know, like it, right. it, it's a bit like dogs. It's a bit like street dogs. When you go on a scooter into a colony, defense colony or something like that, it's like that. So, you know, this, I, I, I've never had issues with the Indian media because on balance, it's histrionic, it's hyperbolic, but the facts are there. I would say the facts are much more there in the Indian media than they are in the Western media. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, which brings me to the final question. You know, we just have another five to seven minutes. Uh, Gaurav, with you, while we are talking about reporting for a war zone, uh, give me a sense of, did you feel, did, were there any moments when you really felt, uh, you know, weak, you felt, you know, scared, Give me a sense of the the person behind the reporter, you know, what he felt, what you've undergone, you know, while reporting from Ukraine. So uh, as a journalist, it was a great experience. Uh, it was the biggest story uh, and uh, we were getting the kind of play uh, that any reporter would uh, dream of both on Ajtak and on India Today, uh, the best channels in our country. And I'm very proud to say that. Um, and India Today magazine. Uh, so... Uh, were we scared? Yes, there were some instances, uh, you know, at a time when, when the government, uh, the Indian embassy packed up from Kiev, first went to Lviv and then went uh, left Lviv, went to Poland. Um, and when shelling started in Kiev, everyone was advised to leave. Everyone uh, was told to leave and ev almost everyone left. Uh, but I wanted to stay on because I thought this is where the story is. So, uh, you know, I, and I've preserved all those WhatsApp exchanges that I was having with the office when at one point of time I was told, this is an instruction, leave now. And I actually sent a message saying, can I please defy the instruction and stay on, uh, uh, you know, at, at my own risk? Can I sign an indemnity bond? Can I stay on? Uh, and, and ultimately, I'm so glad my channel had that faith in me that they permitted us to stay on, the, both the camera person and I, uh, Pawan Kumar and I, and we stayed on. We were forcibly checked out of our hotel uh, because that's when the situation became very bad. They forced us out of the hotel they were almost forcing journalists onto trains to take them to Lviv. We actually smuggled ourselves into an Indian uh, gentleman's house. Uh, you know, one Mr. Kuldeep Kumar, he's a businessman there, there. So we went to his house, stayed with him, and then traveled on our own because no fixer, no guide, no one available to carry, to take you anywhere. And when we were driving, there were instances that people, you were being shelled at, fired at. When we were coming out of Mariupol, they, we were live on India today and there was firing happening at our vehicle, uh, which Rajesh actually reported, oh my God, he said they're, they're firing at us. So that that happened, but uh, and, and I was driving and I really drove very fast out of there. Another instance, we took a wrong turn and that was the time I was genuinely scared because for, we drove from, from Derepro or Nipa uh, towards Kiev and for about 200 kilometers down that road, we didn't come across a single other vehicle. And I said, that's really odd. Why isn't there a single other vehicle on this road? We had actually missed a signboard that said, road closed. This road is mined. There were mines on that road and we were driving. We were zipping down that road, uh, trying to get to Kiev until somebody told us, get the hell out of here, you could die. Uh, so some, some such instances, but all worth covering that war to be able to bring out facts for our viewers here. Shweta, your story? I have a more selfish intention when I cover war. I always wanted to join the, the army, but uh, women don't have a combat role, so I could never get in. So uh, I'm not scared to the point of being suicidal. And uh, the day Gaurav and I were in Irpin, none of the international media had stopped two kilometers before uh, the final check post. And there was actually live shelling going on. And we were so excited that I said, nee, chalo, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. So uh, to the point where uh, actually the army was. So uh, I, I love it. I don't know uh, what a, when, when you get hit by a bullet, how would it feel like? And I don't want to think about it. A stone probably scares me more than a bullet. <laughs> I don't want to be handicapped for life. But bullet. But when that day, the, we, we shot an airplane, the next day, uh, the, the first journalist casualty happened, who was actually um, shot at by a sniper. I don't know, a Ukrainian sniper or a, a Russian sniper, because Russia never owned up and Ukraine always said it was a Russian. And it was a uh, BBC journalist and uh, some American journalists and uh, uh, also a few Ukrainians who were there as fixers, though they were also journalists. So uh, we lost a few journalists to shelling as well. But um, there was no point. Uh, I was scared and Gaurav knows that. I always want to be there in the front. And I, I don't know if this has, uh, I, I hope there's no bad ending to this because I never think ahead. I don't think 
when such things happen i actually uh, enjoy it especially when my country was not involved we were not losing anything uh, abhijit you said that uh, in a way you love the way we report you know the indian media reports you know it does the best job uh, as a critic is there anything they could improve uh, in your view as far as war, war reporting is concerned uh you know i think it's better if shweta and gorav do not listen to me on this because i am so occidental i will probably destroy the profitability of their channel if i give them my uh opinions on how to cover a war so i think you know when i i generally while i tend to, i've grown up in the ussr and vienna and things like that so you know my my entire outlook on things is very western in a sense but that is where you come to appreciate that when something violates your sensibilities or rather opposes your sensibilities uh it can very frequently be much better so i think my only advice is guys just do what you're doing we love you and you're actually really great at your jobs so don't i mean we shouldn't be seeking the validation of others oh, let's just do our own thing we're great at what we do and we should just continue doing that screw all those international awards you know we shouldn't become uh, ali rental monkeys to perform in their circus if anything they need to become paid monkeys in our circus oh absolutely amen to that uh, thank you so much uh, uh, abhijit gorav shweta vinit and mega had to leave for a show and and karan my colleague thank you so much for joining us